Well, good afternoon. And thank you for being here. My name is Neil Siegel. I uh, teach and write in the areas of U.S. constitutional law and federal courts. I also co-direct, along with my colleague Chris Schrader, uh, the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, for those first-year students in the audience, I want to bid you a very warm welcome uh, to law school and to Duke. Uh, we are very glad to have you. Uh, today's review of select important civil decisions, that is to say non-criminal decisions, of the Supreme Court of the United States uh, during the past term is sponsored by Duke's program in public law. Uh, the program fosters better understanding of public institutions in the United States, uh, the constitutional powers and limits within which those institutions operate, and of the laws and legal principles that apply to the work of governmental officials. The program seeks to raise the visibility of public lawyering as an option for law students to pursue at some point over the course of their hopefully long and satisfying careers. Uh, within Duke Law School, the program hosts, sponsors, or co-sponsors uh, a rich array of activities, sometimes uh, by itself, sometimes along with other student organizations. Uh, they include academic conferences open to all members uh, of the law school and university communities, uh, moot courts in pending cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. We're going to have several later this semester in which uh, the lawyers will be arguing before the U.S. Supreme Court will be mooting their cases before a, pa a panel of faculty judges. So be on the lookout uh, for those events. Uh, we also host visits to Duke by past or present elected officials, judges, and public lawyers, including uh, a good number of uh, past and present U.S. Supreme Court justices, and lunch events such as this one on important issues in public law. Uh, the program is sponsored and is supported very generously by one of our alums, Rick Horvitz, uh, Duke Law School class of 1978. And we are very grateful uh, to him for making it possible for us to bring events like this to you. Uh, our subject today is important decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in civil cases during the October 2012 term. Uh, that is the term that just ended at the end of June. Uh, the October 2013 term is going to begin, as it always does, on the first Monday in October. And so please be on the lookout for a Supreme Court preview at around that time. Uh, joining me today are two, and I hope eventually three, of my fabulous colleagues. Uh, first, uh, to my left, uh, Daryl Miller, who is an expert, writes and teaches in the areas of civil rights, constitutional law, civil procedure, and legal history. Uh, he just joined us uh, at Duke to be part of the full-time governing faculty this year, and so I'm very pleased to introduce him uh, to many of you who don't know him yet. Um, I am confident that you're going to be wanting to be taking his classes. Uh, to his left is my colleague and hallmate, uh, Professor Ernie Young, who is uh, an expert in uh, several fields and teaches uh, several of our most important courses, courses in constitutional law, in federal courts, as well as foreign relations uh, law. He is an expert in the, the constitutional law of federalism. Uh, to his left, I hope eventually, uh, is our colleague, uh, uh, much loved former dean of the law school, Kate Bartlett, who is coming from the airport uh, uh, trying to overcome a plane that's experiencing maintenance problems, something I'm sure we've all uh, experienced ourselves. Uh, she is an expert in family law, in employment discrimination, in gender and law, gender theory. Uh, each of our panelists is going to speak for roughly 10 minutes, uh, as will I if time allows, and that will leave uh, some time, we hope, for questions and answers, uh, participation by you folks at the end. Uh, before we begin with Professor Miller, I just want to very briefly give you uh, just a little bit of data about the October 2012 term that I think is illuminating. So the court decided a total of 73 cases after a briefing and oral argument. Justice Anthony Kennedy was in the majority more than any other justice, as he is every term or just about every term. He was in the majority 91% of the time. Uh, the Chief Justice John Roberts was second most often in the majority at 86% of the time. In non-unanimous cases, cases in which uh, there was some 
dissent. Uh, Justice Kennedy was in the majority 83 percent of the time, which was 10 percentage points higher than the runner-up, Chief Justice Roberts. I think Kennedy's influence is particularly felt when the court fractures five to four. So out of the 73 cases that the court decided after briefing an argument, 23 were 5-4 decisions. Kennedy was in the majority in 20 of the 23. Justice Scalia was the second most often in the majority, only 13 of the 23. Uh, finally, uh, you had uh, 16 of those 23 5-4 cases that generated what uh, some court watchers call ideological splits, cases in which you have the so-called conservatives, Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito on one side, and then Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justices uh, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan on the other side, and then Justice Kennedy in the middle going with one side or the other. And I think this past term reform held, which is to say that he was with uh, the conservative camp uh, in 10 out of the 16 cases and with the liberal camp in six out of the 16 cases. So that just gives you some, uh, some uh, numerical appreciation uh, of the court and what it's about. But uh, I think uh, my view, and I suspect the view of my fellow panelists, is that you can't just crunch numbers. Uh, it's part of the difference between, say, uh, a legal approach and a political science approach, or at least many political science approaches. You've got to take a careful look at the cases. Not all cases are worth the same amount. Uh, you've got to study the cases and read them closely to understand the work of the court. And so what I want to do now is turn to my colleagues who are going to identify select cases to talk about. And I do emphasize select. Uh, 73 cases may not sound like all that much for a year's work, but uh, it will be a terrible thing if we tried to cover them all uh, over the next hour. So we'll just look at a few of the cases and invite you to explore more of them on your own or with your professors. Professor Miller. Thanks, Sue. Uh, Neil, I, I appreciate the introduction. and. Um, uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, I see some familiar faces I visited here a couple of years ago. But uh, for those of you that are one else, welcome to law school. Um, you know, I do write in the area of uh, civil procedure, and I do teach it. I'm not teaching it this year. Um, and so one of the cases that I want to talk about is a kind of stealth case, in a, in a way, uh, called American Express Company versus Italian Colors Restaurant. Um, so for those of you that might have had me for, for class once before, um, I use this quote, and it's quite familiar to civil procedure lists, which is uh, John Dingles once uh, uh, said to have quipped that, um, I'll let you write the substance, you let me write the procedure, and I'll screw you every time. Uh, and for those of you that are you know, new to law school and studying civil procedure, you'll soon learn that that's you know, pretty true. Italian Colors is a uh, case that purports to, in some ways to be about procedure, but really it's about substance. Uh, and more importantly, I think, is a case about the degree to which uh, the court is going to allow uh, private con uh, contract, uh, irrespective of sort of the balance of um, uh, negotiating power, uh, to exempt uh, private uh, interests uh, or private parties uh, from what we would otherwise consider good public policy. So let me explain. So there's something uh, called the Federal Arbitration Act, which is actually a, a relatively old act. Um, and what the FAA, the Federal Arbitration Act, says is that uh, an arbitration agreement has to be enforced, save upon such grounds as exist uh, at law and equity for the revocation of any contract. Now, arbitration, for those of you that are uh, unfamiliar, is not mediation. It's not like trying to get a settlement with somebody. Arbitration is where you go to a third party neutral, third party. Uh, to resolve a dispute. And I guarantee you that most of you have probably signed at one point in your life an arbitration agreement. If you've ever downloaded something from iTunes, if you've ever, you know, done the click wrap agreement, if you have a credit card, you've probably agreed to arbitrate. Uh, and so instead of going to a judge, you might go into an office building and there'll be an arbitrator there. Uh, and that person can uh, resolve the dispute. And essentially the difference is not all the procedural uh, protections that are part of an ordinary trial in court uh, are um, uh, available to you in arbitration. It's supposed to be a streamlined process. That's its purpose. Uh, and the FAA is a, um, a congressional statute that basically tries to keep um, uh, arbitration in the, in the loop in terms of uh, ways people can uh, resolve their disputes. Now, lots of things can be arbitrated. Contract disputes, tort claims, intentional tort claims, and importantly for this uh, case, 
uh, even federal laws. It doesn't mean you don't get a hearing, it just means you don't get a hearing maybe in front of a judge. So Italian colors and the other retailers say that America uh, uh, Express is conditioning use of one payment system uh, on the use of another, uh, which is called a tying arrangement under the antitrust laws. Um, and that this tying arrangement is a violation of the antitrust laws uh, in the same way that you wouldn't expect, for example, Duke to say that um, you, you, know, you can only use one, for one shampoo or something to come here and get your law degree. That would be a kind of a tying arrangement. Uh, but there's a catch, right? So Italian Colors, uh, when it agreed to accept these Amex cards, said it's going to arbitrate anything uh, pertaining to this agreement, uh, no matter the theory of the dispute, including uh, federal antitrust laws. So it agreed also that under no circumstances could the dispute be resolved in a class setting uh, or could it be resolved in a way that you could share costs. Now the Supreme Court in other areas has been on a kind of tear with respect to uh, class actions which you might learn in your uh, Civ Pro class or you might learn in a, a complex litigation course. Uh, in a case called Walmart versus Dukes in the past two years, the court basically made it harder to certify class actions in, uh, in federal court. Uh, and this term in a case called Comcast, um, the same thing happened on a slightly different issue about when would there be a predominance issue in terms of certifying a class. Um, on a different track, that is not in the judicial track, but according to the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, the court has also been saying that class action waivers are, are basi basically presumptively uh, enforceable. That is, if you agree to waive the ability to bring in action as a class, uh, that is enforceable and enforceable uh, in arbitration. So who here has ever been overcharged by your credit card? On Anybody? Been? All right. Did you hire a lawyer? No. They dealt with them themselves. Why didn't you hire a lawyer? Was that? They gave, you their money. they gave you your money back. Okay, so they solved the problem. Would you have hired a lawyer for how much? You, was it a thousand bucks? Would you hire a lawyer for twenty-five bucks? <laughs> All right. Now, the idea of a class action, right, is you get screwed out of twenty-five bucks, and then everybody else in this room gets screwed out of twenty-five bucks, and then everybody in Durham gets screwed out of twenty-five bucks, and then everybody in North Carolina gets screwed out 25 bucks. Well, 25 bucks times the population of North Carolina is some significant money, but none of you have an interest in actually pursuing any litigation over this, right? All right, so that's the, one of the theories of, of class actions, is that it's a guard against what are known as negative value lawsuits. It gives an incentive to bring these types of cases. Uh, well, Italian Colors is somewhat of an analogous situation. The restaurant doesn't have an interest to bring an individual action. Why? Because the cost of litigating the case exceed its potential recovery, even with the treble damages that are available uh, in antitrust. Um, and uh, there's no other way to sort of solve the sort of collective action problem because the agreement also says you can't go out and try to uh, join with other parties. You can only bring this individual action. Uh, and you can only bring it in arbitration. Uh, and as Justice Kagan says in her dissent, the majority says to this, well, too darn bad. You agreed to it. Uh, the fact that it's too expensive to arbitrate a Sherman antitrust claim uh, doesn't mean that you can't bring the act uh, individually. Uh, therefore, you agreed not to proceed as a class, uh, freedom of contract, uh, and you can't litigate this class action. Um, and that's the kind of simple way that the majority, I mean, it's a simple proposition. It's a, it's a contract issue. You agreed not to bring class actions. It's enforceable. Arms length transactions, that's the end. But Justice Kagan says, wait, 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 wait. Um, you say this is about class actions, but it isn't. Because there is a proposition, right, that um, you can't, in an arbitration agreement, simply um, uh, prospectively opt out of what we all think is good public policy. So an agreement, Justice Kagan says, that, was, that said, uh, you agree never to bring a Sherman antitrust uh, action um, uh, would be unenforceable as a matter of public policy. Uh, but, you know, you all are lawyers, or becoming lawyers, I'm a lawyer, we're all clever people, and we don't need to do that, right? 
Um, you know, the example that came to mind is I thought was if you had a, pro a, a, a provision in an agreement that says you can bring a Sherman Antitrust Act, but you can only argue it in the form of a haiku, right? Uh, you can still bring it, yeah, but you're not going to have a really effective way of vindicating that uh, public policy. Uh, and uh, Justice Kagan says, look, that's what's really at issue here. This you majority, uh, written by Justice Scalia, you say this is about class actions, but this is about the effective vindication of federal law. Uh, and she says, uh, in a little less sort of whimsical uh, example, look, you know, if you try to prospectively bar somebody from bringing any economic uh, evidence as part of their case, how are you going to prove up your antitrust uh, uh, action? whether in federal, you know, whether in court or in arbitration. Uh, so what she says is, again, that this is basically a matter of effective vindication. And although the majority sort of has these asides that maybe if it was really expensive to file um, or maybe um, some other sort of uh, rules that would keep you from uh, having your chance to effectively uh, litigate your Sherman Antitrust Act, maybe those would be okay. Um, she says, don't believe you for a second, because what this is about is a far broader proposition about the ability to bring uh, Sherman Antitrust Acts or other matters of federal policy uh, and the ability to basically opt out of them through uh, agreements to arbitrate. Um, so don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean that, you know, all of federal antitrust has is, is gone down the tubes. Uh, it still can be brought. It can be brought, for example, by the Department of Justice. It's just that we've got a kind of idea here that um, uh, sort of tradition in American, in, in American law that there's going to be private enforcement of these types of norms. Uh, and to the extent that those kind of private enforcement of norms is cut off, then we end up having to rely more on other types of institutions, government institutions, state institutions to defend them, and they have their own problems, right? There's all kinds of public choice problems, there's all kinds of rent seeking problems, there are elected officials, and that's one of the things that, uh, I mean, the macro issue about this um, uh, Amex case uh, brings to, to mind. And the uh, one other thought before I sort of um, hand it over to, to Professor Young, which is the other big macro issue, I think, is um, this fits within the court's sort of general kind of laissez-faire view about how things should operate. I mean, the whole idea that you entered into the contract, and I don't care what these other sort of provisions of, of, of uh, congressional law are, um, you can opt out of them, sort of presupposes that the market can function to solve these issues. You just won't, uh, you know, get Amex cards. You won't buy something. You won't, you know, you won't do the click wrap. Um, but the irony, of course, is that, uh, you know, this is a case about the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is an act designed to stop monopoly. And so what we have, as Justice Kagan points out in the dissent, is a monopoly using monopoly power to opt out of monopoly, um, you know, enforcement. Um, and monopoly, by its very terms, is supposed to be a market failure. It's, it develops because the market's not working. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ernie. Thank you, Professor Miller. Okay, well, I also want to thank Professor Siegel on the program in public law. It's nice to be back and talking about the Supreme Court. Um, I'm going to talk about two and a half cases. I'm going to talk about Kia Bell versus Royal Dutch Petroleum, um, United States versus Windsor, and I'm going to say a little bit about Hollingsworth versus Perry, but that'll be half baked. Um, Kia Bell is, in a way, a lot like. Um, the Italian colors case, and that it's also a case in which the court seems to be cutting back on private enforcement in favor of other ways of enforcing norms. But, but Kia Bell is probably the biggest international human rights case that the Supreme Court has considered, at least since Medellin versus Texas in 2008. This is a case about the alien tort statute, which is one of the more obscure, and that's saying something, provisions of the 1789 Judiciary Act. It provides for federal court jurisdiction in a suit by an alien for a tort only in violation of the law of nations. And there is no legislative history, and nobody knows why it's there, and, and lots of judges have liked to make obscure opera jokes about you know, how obscure the alien tort statute is. Um, it's, you know, it, to the extent that we know anything about why it's in the original Judiciary Act, there, there seems to be a problem with 
you know, aliens getting abused within the territorial United States. A lot of French diplomats seem to get beat up in bars, often by other <laughs> Frenchmen, and there weren't other effective remedies um, for those violations of their international law rights, and this is meant to, to make sure that the federal courts are able to hear suits by aliens when their rights have been violated. Um, but it basically was a sleepy little part of the Judiciary Act until about 1980, when the, when the Second Circuit decided a case called Phil Artigo, which was about a, a young man that was tortured to death down in South America, and his family sued his torturer under the Alien Tort Statute in a federal district court in New York. And then the federal district court up, upheld, and the Second Circuit as well, upheld jurisdiction under the Alien Tort Statute, and the Alien Tort Statute became a, 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 a tool for vindicating international human rights, typically not treaty rights, but rights under customary international law, which is the rights that arise organically out of the, the practice of, of nations entered into for a, out of a sense of legal obligation. Um, and so the first wave of alien tort statute um, litigation in the 1980s um, was mostly symbolic. It was hard to get jurisdiction over people, certainly hard to get jurisdiction over their money, to get any sort of execution on a judgment, um, even if you were able to get a court to, to issue a judgment against a human rights violator. Um, but it probably did some good in, in developing principles of international human rights laws. There was probably some symbolic vindication for the victims, which, which helps um, in a non-trivial way. Um, but one thing to understand is that these, in most of these cases were what we call in the business um, foreign cubed cases. So they're foreign plaintiffs to sue by an alien, typically against a foreign defendant, and typically for actions that took place in a foreign country. So, you know, Joelito Filartiga was tortured um, down in South America by a South American, you know, and he, he was from there as well. Um, the second wave of alien tort statute litigation was also mostly foreign cubed cases, but it was against corporate defendants. Um, and then these were typically multinational corporations that were accused of aid, aiding and abetting or participating in, and somehow implicated in the human rights violations of foreign governments and foreign actors. So the facts of Kiobel are, are fairly typical of this. So the defendant um, were oil companies that were engaged in oil exploration and production in Nigeria. Um, they um, were cooperating with the Nigerian government to provide security for their operations. The Nigerian government was not um, all that gentle um, with the people that it was providing security against in uh, many instances. And so the plaintiffs alleged that they were the victims of extrajudicial killings, torture, or other very serious human rights violations. Um, and it's not much to fun to sue Nigeria in American courts because of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. It's, it's made it very difficult to recover um, in cases like this. It's a lot more fun to sue a, a deep pocket um, multinational corporation that you can say was aiding and abetting. And have been aiding and abetting. And so the second wave um, offered the prospect of meaningful redress um, for human rights vic victims if they could actually recover monetary judgments against people you could execute a judgment against. Um, on the other hand, it aroused a lot of very um, defensive uh, reaction from multinational corporations, as you can imagine. And so Kia Bell is the first of the second wave of ATS cases to reach the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court initially takes the case to determine whether the alien tort statute even allows you to sue a corporation. Um, or whether you can just sue individuals, like, like officers of a foreign government. And the reason why that's dif a difficult question is that the liability of corporations is a lot less well-developed in international law than it is in domestic law. And so there is a question there. But they, they brief the case. They have oral argument. Um, and it becomes clear at oral argument that what the court's not really, not really worried about is not so much the corporate nature of the defendants, but the fact that all of this stuff took place you know, over the horizon in, in, in another country. It's a foreign cubed case. And so they order the case rebriefed, re-argued on the question of whether the alien tort statute provides a cause of action in cases involving wholly extraterritorial activity. And the court decides that question 9-0 um, in favor of the defendants. Now, it's 9 to 0 in terms of the result that this case did not fall within the alien tort statute, but the court divides 5 to 4 in its rationale in a way that has implications going forward. So Chief Justice writes for the majority and says, you know, extraterritoriality, there's a strong presumption in construing federal statutes not to be extraterritorial. There's no evidence 
basically about any intent in, in the alien tort statute, and certainly not any evidence that Congress intended it to cover foreign cubed situations, and so this is a pretty easy case. Justice Breyer writes for four, you know, and you can guess the names, um, and says, you know, we agree that this is a, a pretty easy case, but um, we think that you shouldn't conclusively rule out extraterritorial application. Instead, there should be room for hearing alien tort statute cases in, in cases that implicate important U.S. interests. And, and the critical move is that one of the important U.S. interests that Justice Breyer is willing to contemplate having ATS cases for is the interest of the United States in not becoming a haven for human rights violators around the world. That implicates a, a concept in international law called universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is the idea that some people are so bad and so dangerous and there's such collective action problems in going after them that any country that can get a hold of them ought to be able to institute judicial proceedings against them. So pirates, for instance, or terrorists, or human rights violators in really, really serious cases. And Justice Breyer is willing to contemplate, at least in some circumstances, using the Alien Tort Statute as a form of, of universal jurisdiction against international human rights violators. And so the fight going forward is going to be you know, between the, the Roberts vision of the statute, which is narrower, and the Breyer vision of the statute, which is broader. And this will shock you, but Justice Kennedy wrote a concurrence, which was about a paragraph long, and basically all it said was, hi, I'm Justice Kennedy, I'm still here, and I'm still in charge, and I haven't really quite made up my mind yet, so you should direct all future arguments to me. Right? <laughs> And that's what people are going to do. I think there are three issues that are, are outstanding. One is, what about U.S. defendants? So the, the Royal Dutch Petroleum Company, the only contact with the United States really was that they were listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And all nine justices viewed that was not enough. You're not providing a haven for international human rights violators just by listing them on the Stock Exchange. But what about American corporations, Exxon or, or, or somebody like that, that's engaged in similar activities abroad and may become embroiled with human rights violations abroad. You know, and it, it seems pretty clear, at least for the five justices in the majority, that it's going to take more than just the fact that they're a U.S. corporation. You may have to show something like they, they planned their, their collusion with the foreign authorities you know, in the United States or something like that. But that all remains to be hashed out. And I think that's going to be a very difficult question. Um, the other questions that have been kicking around ATS cases for a while are also still in play, at least with regard to U.S. defendants. Like, can they be corporate defendants? They still haven't decided that question. Is there even such a thing as aiding and abetting liability under the Alien Tort Statutes? Various circuits have decided that question, but the Supreme Court's never come anywhere near it. So, you know, stay tuned. There's going to be more litigation. The other interesting question is, you know, well, if these are tort cases, why not bring them in state court under state law, right? If the federal courts turn out to be be you know, close to you, then why not go down to South Texas and, and get a, in front of one of those generous to plaintiff's juries and ask for 10 bajillion dollars, right? That would be awesome. And I have to say, I, 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 I'm skeptical of these ATS cases, um, but I also have you know, a little plaintiff's lawyer inside trying to get out. And, and I have this fantasy, I'll, I'll admit, about you know, Joe Jamail deposing Slobodan Milosevic. I mean, if you've seen the Joe Jamail YouTube video, and if you haven't, you need to go watch it. Just imagine him going after an international human rights violator like that. It would be awesome. So I'm not convinced that these cases should go away entirely. Um, the last question is really, will Congress intervene? Right. Will Congress act to clarify this, uh, this up? Because I think the, the, the worst, uh, these cases raise a lot of difficult questions about their interaction and interference with American foreign policy. And it's tough to try, the, try to find the answers in this very cryptic text that was enacted in 1789. So as much as I love old stuff, I think we probably need some new clarification in this area. All right, so that's key about. Now, I'm going to talk about same-sex marriage. Two cases, United States versus Windsor and Hollingsworth versus Perry. Perry was about a state prohibition on same-sex marriage out in California, Proposition 8, which was an initiative of, uh, uh, under the California initiative process, which amended the state constitution to prohibit same-sex marriage. Windsor was about a federal law, the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, um, which for purposes of federal law, federal benefits, federal responsibilities, federal obligations, define marriage as exclusively between a man and a woman. Now, both of these cases had you know, interesting questions on the merits. They also had really good standing questions. So I'm going to talk about the standing questions first, because you know, that's what I do. Um, 
Both of these cases were occasioned by the fact that the relative executive branch authorities had refused to, to defend the underlying laws. So in California, Governor Schwarzenegger and his attorney general um, had both refused to defend the constitutionality of Proposition 8. They thought it violated the Equal Protection Clause. And the question in, in Hollingsworth versus Perry was whether the original proponents of the popular, popular referendum could intervene and defend it in their stead. And under state law, it was absolutely clear that they could. The Supreme Court said that's not good enough for federal law purposes, which is what we're dealing with, because we're dealing with Article III standing. That's not good enough, um, and they don't have standing to pursue that case in the Supreme Court. Standing. Yeah, standing is the right to sue generally. It's usually something that we worry about with respect to plaintiffs. But it's also you know, a, a question with respect to defendants, because the party that's invoking the jurisdiction of the federal court has to assert that they're the right party to be litigating that case. And if you're on appeal, for instance, and it's the defendant that's appealing, they're the ones that have to show that they have standing. Right? So the proponents of this, um, this initi initiative had intervened as defendants, but they want to appeal the case, and they're not allowed to do that by the Supreme Court. Now, that actually is a pretty significant holding in terms of states with initiative processes, because the whole point of initiative processes is that the, the incumbent officials who have been elected in the, in the state government are not doing what the people want. They're circumventing the will of the people. And so the initiative process is a way for the people to take back charge of what's going on. Now, if you can you know, just void the result of an initiative by refusing to defend its constitutionality, that's a pretty neat trick for getting around the initiative process. And it's precisely those original recalcitrant state officials who are going to be making that call. So you know, the Supreme Court seems to endanger the efficacy of initiative processes around the country. I think it would not be that hard to redraft these statutes to get around the holding in, in Hollingsworth versus Perry. So Windsor, um, the standing issue in Windsor is occasioned by the fact that the Obama administration decides not to defend the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act because they also think that it violates the Equal Protection Clause. Now, somewhat surprisingly, though, they decide to go right on enforcing the Defense of Marriage Act. So they enforce it in a case involving Edith Windsor and, and her deceased same-sex spouse, Thea Spire. Edith Win Windsor and, and Thea Spires were, were recognized as married under the laws of New York, but they were not recognized under federal law um, as a result of the Defense of Marriage Act. And so when Thea Spire dies and leaves a whole passel of money to Edith Windsor, the IRS doesn't recognize her as entitled to the marital deduction, and they say, you owe us $360,000. And the Obama administration is still enforcing the statute. They're just not defending it as constitutional. So we think it's clearly unconstitutional, but we still want your money. And you might ask, how is that consistent with your oath to uphold the Constitution, to enforce a, a statute that you think is so clearly unconstitutional that you can't defend it in court? In any event, that creates a ra rather interesting standing problem because they, the plaintiffs win in the lower courts. They win in the district court and they win in the Second Circuit. And then the United States, which has lost, right, I mean, in the sense that its statute is unconstitutional and they have been ordered to pay $360,000, now appeal, wants to appeal that question to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right? Now, it's not like nobody is in the case trying to defend the statute. There, there's an entity called the Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, BLAG. Right? If you're designing an, an entity and can call it anything you want, don't call it something that will acronymize as BLAG. Right? <laughs> but BLAG is pretty serious about defending the constitutionality of the DOMA because they hired this guy, Paul Clement, who's supposed to be a pretty good lawyer. And he makes you know, pretty emphatic arguments that the DOMA is unconstitutional. So we go merrily up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, hey, there might not be a justiciable case in controversy because the people who appeal the United States have agreed with the ruling below, and that's not really cricket. And Justice Kennedy says, well, look, there's still a case or controversy because you haven't given the money back, right? The IRS is still holding the money, so there's no question of standing or anything like that. The only question is whether you guys are at each other's throats enough to provide adequate adversary presentation. And it's okay that you're not because Paul Clement is at your throats, and we're going to have plenty of good argument on both sides of this case, right? That's the standing question. The merits are also kind of interesting. Um, 
the standard argument advanced by the Obama administration and by the plaintiffs in this case is that sexual orientation should be a suspect classification under the Equal Protection Clause, which means that laws that classify on the basis of sexual orientation ought to be subject to some form of heightened scrutiny. And most people, I, I think, agree that a, a, a law banning same-sex marriage is going to have a tough time if you can get to some form of heightened scrutiny. On the other hand, if there's not a suspect classification and you apply the traditional form of review for things that don't implicate fundamental rights or suspect classifications, rational basis review, that's generally a rubber stamp that will uphold whatever law is challenged. So this case is all about getting to heightened scrutiny. Um, people thought, I thought, um, even though this was not the argument that, uh, that you know, I worked on in this case, um, that the court would probably decide this on, equal, on standard equal protection grounds, have to recognize sexual orientation as a suspect classification, side and scrutiny, strike the statute down. That is not what the court did. What the court did instead was to really emphasize that marriage is traditionally within the purview of state governments to define. There are no federal marriages. Federal government doesn't issue federal marriage license and generally tries to, st tries to take state law as it finds it for purposes of federal law. So what, you know, if, if federal law turns on whether you're married or not, generally speaking, they will just accept whether state law thinks that you're married or not, except for same-sex couples. And so this was a really unusual departure from the ordinary federal division of labor in our constitutional system. Um, and I think that had three impacts on the way the court analyzed the case. The first is that in any equal protection case, you have to ask if people who are being discriminated between are similarly situated. Right? Are, are, they, are they the relevant comparators? So does it make sense to compare same-sex couples to different sex couples? That's a hard question because it really depends on your prior moral views about what marriage is, right? Is marriage independent of who's doing it? Or is marriage just something that happens between a man or a woman, right? And the Constitution isn't going to help you all that much in answering that question, I think. So it's a pretty hard question. What Justice Kennedy does is he says, look, that is a hard question, but New York has answered it. And it's traditionally New York's job to answer it. New York has decided through its democratic processes that marriage can be, it is independent of who does it. And it can be between same-sex couples and non-same-sex couples. So state law defines the, the relevant class. And the federal government is discriminating within that class between people that state law defines as similarly situated. All right? So that, so that frames the equal protection question in an absolutely critical way. The second thing that, it, that the court does is it says certain interests are out of bounds for the federal government. The main interest that Blagg argued in defense of the statute was we have the same right to define marriage for purposes of federal law that a state government would have to define it for purposes of state law. We are a coordinate sovereign. We get to have marriages too. And the court just says no way. That's not an interest that you have. They, they, they refuse to even consider that interest. In fact, they say that the fact that Congress meant to interfere with state definitions of marriage is the illegitimate purpose that damns this law. Right? And then the third thing that I think they do is that they're a little less deferential between, about the fit between the means that the law promotes and the, and, or the law employs and the ends that it promotes than they usually would be under traditional rational basis review. They say, look, there, it, it, there's not a good fit between other federal interests like saving money, for instance, and this very, very broad Defense of Marriage Act. That would be okay under ordinary rational basis review, but I think it's because of the extraordinary intrusion on the federal relationship that the court ratchets up the, the level of scrutiny. So the, the big question is, what happens in cases like Perry when they come back to the court and somebody has standing? What are we going to do about same-sex prohibitions at the state level? And the answer is, I don't think Windsor is going to control those cases. But I also don't think the federalism argument in Windsor is going to undermine the original equal protection argument against state same-sex marriage bans. They're just, just two separate questions. Um, and so that, that's going to be the interesting issue going forward. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Young. And Professor Bartlett has not arrived yet, so uh, let me speak for a while. Uh, you'll find that uh, law professors, like lawyers, like judges, often disagree. Um, and um, uh, I have a very uh, different view uh, than Professor Young uh, on what the Windsor Court did on the merits and the extent to which Windsor is authority that is relevant when the court decides the question 
of the constitutionality of state prohibitions on same-sex marriage. I, I would describe Professor Young's reading, which is, uh, uh, as I would call it, the state's rights reading. Others would call it the federalism reading. Uh, and the idea is that Windsor has no implications for the constitutionality of state prohibitions on same-sex marriage. It was about the lack of a federal interest uh, in regulating marriage. And I read Windsor uh, very differently. I, I think there is some of that language in the majority opinion. The court talks about what New York elect to do. Uh, but there's also other language. Uh, Justice Kennedy said for the majority that when New York decided to allow same-sex marriage, it sought to eliminate inequality. It didn't say it sought to eliminate inequality as New York understands inequality. The court said that DOMA writes inequality into the entire United States Code. It didn't say that Congress did this as it understands inequality. Right? So it seems to me that there are implications uh, for the constitutionality of state prohibitions on same-sex marriage. The court effectively applied heightened scrutiny here, not because of the federalism component primarily, but for the same reasons that it did it in previous cases involving state laws cases called Romer and Lawrence, in which the court said rational basis, but in fact applied heightened scrutiny. So I would read uh, the court's decision more broadly, uh, specifically uh, that DOMA violates the equal protection principles uh, protected by the Fifth Amendment's due process clause because it had not only the purpose, but also the effect and social meaning of demeaning the dignity of gay people by excluding them from an institution that is not inherently unsuitable to their inclusion. And there is rhetoric to the contrary, but nothing in the logic of the opinion rests on the fact that New York, as opposed to North Carolina, chose to recognize same-sex marriage. Um, I think which reading you adopt, first it just speaks to how you read a case, but I think they have very different implications, uh, very different implications for state bans on same-sex marriage going forward and the extent to which Windsor is authority uh, for, for their invalidation. Um, I also think that We've seen this before. Um, we've seen some of this um, talk about the fact that a state recognizes marriage or that marriage is implicated before. And so in Griswold against Connecticut in 1965, when the court first upheld the fundamental right to contraception, it was all about the sacred precincts of the marital bedroom and marital privacy. And of course, married couples have a right to contraception until a few years later in Eisenstadt against Baird, it didn't have anything to do with marriage at all. It had to do with individuals. So I see Justice Kennedy trying to provide, um, trying to encourage before he coerces. He's not formally adopting heightened scrutiny. He's not formally saying state bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional, right? There's language that gives opponents of same-sex marriage something to hang on to to try and distinguish Windsor if they want to. But I see it as more rhetorical. I see it as more um, uh, as a matter of statesmanship, as a matter of um, um, uh, not deciding the whole question now, but in terms of the logic and the analysis, uh, in terms of how this is going to be used uh, and how it's going to be used most effectively, I think, I think there are implications for, for same-sex marriage. Uh, we haven't talked at all about, um, but that's, you know, this, this happens all the time in law, right? People are going to disagree, and, and I'm you know, quite certain that um, uh, I haven't persuaded Pro Professor Young, and, and he would have uh, <laughs> right, uh, plenty of responses to me. Uh, we haven't talked about two very important race cases that I want to put on, on the table. The first is Fisher against UT Austin. This is a 7-1 decision with Justice Kagan recused. Uh, and if this is a race affirmative action case and you've got seven justices in the majority, you know they didn't decide uh, nearly as much as you might have thought they would when they took uh, the case. This involved the affirmative action admissions program at UT Austin. Uh, UT, after the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans, prohibit affirmative action in higher education in the 1990s, adopted a 10% plan. Namely, the top 10% of graduates of each high school class are guaranteed admission to UT. And this was done uh, at the time for the race conscious purpose of trying to preserve racial diversity at UT in the wake of the Fifth Circuit's invalidation of affirmative action admissions. Uh, after the court decided in 2003, the US Supreme Court, that in fact, universities could use race as a plus factor, uh, as a factor, as a consideration in their admissions decisions. Uh, then UT grafted on top of the percent plan this use of race as a consideration, as a plus. Um, and the court in, in 2003 said, you have to consider the overall contribution of the individual, of the candidate. Race can't just be the entire factor, but it can be one, all right, um, uh, one consideration. 
And what's before the court in Fisher is that use of race as a plus, not the percent plan. In fact, something that's striking about the decision is that every justice, including uh, the justice most committed to colorblindness, Justice Thomas, uh, seems to agree that the percent plan is not based on race. It's not problematic. And so even among the conservatives, there seems to be a dis difference between colorblindness and uses of racial classifications, which can have all kinds of implications in other areas of the law. It focuses on the, the plus factor and what Justice Kennedy does in a clear compromise opinion, uh, because he gets Justices Breyer and Sotomayor to join an opinion that they wouldn't have written themselves. Uh, what, what they basically do is throw the case back to the, the Fifth Circuit, saying that the Fifth Circuit was too deferential in upholding the program, that universities get some deference in concluding that racial diversity is a compelling governmental interest under the appropriate standard of review, which is called strict scrutiny, which shows a lot of skepticism towards governmental uses of race, but that the universities get no deference when it comes to uh, the narrow tailoring inquiry of strict scrutiny, whether the use of race is necessary or narrowly tailored to advance the interest in diversity. And specifically, Justice Kennedy focused on the requirement of narrow tailoring called race-neutral alternatives saying that the university needs to first show that no race-neutral alternatives would do the job before it uses race. It's not clear what this means. Um, I do think my own view is that the court has moved the goalposts. The court has changed the law. Uh, this is a differently constituted court than existed when Justice O'Connor Justice wrote the court's 2003 decision in Grutter. I think you're going to see more litigation, more constitutional challenges to affirmative action admissions. Um, it's not clear exactly what the university is going to have to show. Um, in the Grutter case, Justice O'Connor referenced race-neutral alternatives and, in my judgment, didn't really uh, enforce it to any great extent, didn't really um, hold the university to account um, to make a demonstration that it had tried and failed to use them. Now the court seems to be not just talking the talk of strict scrutiny, but really meaning it, uh, really holding universities to account. So we'll have to see. The case goes back to the Fifth Circuit. Um, I think you're going to see more litigation and more invalidation. <laughs> the court has not ended affirmative action in higher education, right? But it does seem to uh, some, does seem to be um, does seem to be uh, narrowing the circumstances in which it's going to be available. Uh, Justice Thomas was the only one who really um, went to war in this case. He wrote a long, provocative, concurring opinion in which he likened the arguments of affirmative action's defenders to slaveholders and segregationists. Um, the only thing he didn't say is which side of the case the slaveholders and segregationists would have been on uh, if they were alive today. Uh, Justice Ginsburg was the only dissenter. Uh, and in her view, uh, the university had already complied with the form of strict scrutiny that the Grutter Court insisted on uh, and shouldn't have to uh, uh, be held to a higher standard going forward. She also said that only an ostrich could believe um, that these percent plans are race unconscious or race neutral when the intended effect of them is to increase the racial diversity of the class. Uh, the other decision, uh, this is, I think, is by far the most important decision of the term um, and um, certainly the most momentous, significant invalidation of a federal law by the court, uh, in my judgment, in recent memory. Uh, here, the court invalidated uh, Section 4, uh, the coverage formula in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in a case called Shelby County, Alabama, against Holder. Uh, the VRA was passed to address entrenched racial discrimination in voting uh, during the 1960s. Uh, Section 5, the preclearance requirement requires certain states and parts of states, mainly but not exclusively in the South, to obtain permission or preclearance from the federal government before changing voting rules. It puts the burden on jurisdictions with a history of discrimination in voting uh, to show that any voting change, whether it's a voter ID law or a change in a polling place, won't make worse off the minority voters protected by the law. And then in Section 4, the court provided the coverage formula for determining the jurisdictions to which Section 5 applies. And it defined them as states or political subdivisions uh, that use tests or devices as prerequisites to voting and had low voter registration turnout in the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, the preclearance requirement and the coverage formula reauthorized several times in 2006. It was reauthorized again for 25 years, but the coverage formula was not changed. Uh, shortly after the reauthorization in 2006, a utility district in Texas sought to bail out uh, of the act's coverage. And alternatively, if it couldn't bail out to get out from under the preclearance requirement, it sought to have it held facially unconstitutional. 
and the court resolved that case on statutory grounds, allowing the district to bail out, and therefore didn't have to decide the question of constitutionality. This is now in 2009, but Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion, um, I believe for eight justices, an opinion the liberals joined, sending a clear warning that this statute was very vulnerable, it was constitutionally suspect, it was based on outdated data, and Congress ought to do something about it, or the court might have to strike it down. Well, that's what the court did in Shelby County against Alabama, uh, a case in which uh, this covered jurisdiction in Alabama uh, sought to officially invalidate both the coverage formula and the preclearance requirement. The court split 5-4, an ideological split, an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, and said that the coverage formula uh, is unconstitutional, so it cannot be used any longer as the basis uh, for, for subjecting jurisdictions to preclearance. Um, and the Chief Justice emphasized that uh, the statute has to be justified by current needs and a departure from what he called the fundamental principle of equal sovereignty, equal state sovereignty, requires a showing that the statute's disparate geographic coverage is sufficiently related to the problem that it targets. Uh, Roberts said that this was justified in 1966, but not today. Times have changed. Uh, in, he said because of the Voting Rights Act, right, there isn't the same kind of racial discrimination in voting in covered jurisdictions that there used to be. Uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, wrote uh, the dissent. Uh, it was an emphatic, a vehement dissent, in my, my view, the best dissent of her career. Uh, and whereas Chief Justice Roberts hung on to this notion of equal state sovereignty, Ginsburg emphasized deference to Congress and rational basis review, that Congress is given the authority to enforce the 15th Amendment and is given the authority to enforce it by appropriate legislation, which was a self-conscious invocation by the framers of the Reconstruction Amendments uh, to rely on the deferential logic of McCulloch against Maryland. Uh, and she said there was plenty of evidence in the record to justify Congress's reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, even if the coverage formula, even if the data was old, and even if it wasn't ideal from a contemporary point of view, there was nonetheless lots and lots of evidence that she recounted in her dissent that she engaged, and I wish I had time uh, to share uh, with you, but I don't. And so she would have uh, upheld the statute, um, and she uh, declared that the court erred egregiously by overriding Congress's decision. Uh, she said that it was sort of like closing your umbrella in a rainstorm. To say that we have to get rid of the Voting Rights Act because it's been so successful is like closing your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. The very success of the statute ought not to demand its dormancy. Um, I think it is a hugely important decision, um, and I speak. I think it speaks volumes about the assertiveness, uh, the aggressiveness of the Roberts Court, uh, particularly in the area of race. We have uh, still um, uh, six minutes. Uh, Professor Bartley, would you like to talk briefly about the Title VII cases? I've already introduced you. Okay. So two more discrimination cases. I can be short because U.S. Air ate my notes. Um, <laughs> um, both under Title VII, which is a statute that prohibits discrimination in the workplace, uh, in, in uh, workplaces of more than 15 employees, and it and only holds employers liable. So the, the first case I want to mention, um, Vance versus Ball State, is important because it's about, since you can't, uh, since the statute doesn't allow recovery against anyone other than the employer itself, the question is, uh, when uh, can a plaintiff recover for harassment when somebody else in the workplace is harassing them? The question is whether is who's a supervisor? Because if it's the supervisor who is doing the harassing, the employer will be vicariously liable. It is liable even if it didn't know about uh, the harassment. Um, and so it's very important who a supervisor is. Vance versus Ball State. Um, um, takes the narrowest possible definition, that is a supervisor is one who has the power to hire and fire, and excludes a whole set of potential harassers who have other kinds of powers in the workplace, like powers to set hours, vacation time, um, uh, recommendations for promotions, all other kinds of things that may have power over the employee. The courts generally up until this case had assumed that, that uh, anything with what the EEOC called um, uh, had, had a tangible, um, could, could amount to a tangible employment action, the person who had the power to do that was a supervisor and thus the employer would be liable for the uh, supervisor's harassment unless the employer met 
a particular burden, which was that the, the uh, plaintiff didn't um, make use of a reasonable complaint procedure and, and so on. So it's, it's, it, it allows a plaintiff to show and establish harassment um, uh, only against supervisors um, that have this power to hire and fire. Otherwise, if it's, if it's any other kind of what we might think of, of as a powerful person in the workplace or even a peer, the uh, employee needs to show negligence, which is some fault on the part of the em employer that's linked to uh, allowing the harassment to continue. So it's a very much harder case to, uh, to make. The, the other case has to do with um, the issue of retaliation, which, which had become one of the most important areas of Title VII law. So the, uh, the, the, the Congress and, 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 the, court, and the courts interpreting the, uh, Title VII had established that retaliation was also a form of discrimination in the workplace. You couldn't treat, some, you couldn't discriminate against somebody because they had reported you, even if the underlying thing that was reported turns out not to be serious enough to be a Title, a title VII violation, you can still be protected from being retaliated against. The issue this term had to do with what happens if in addition to retaliating against someone for, uh, on the basis of their race or sex or religion or color, the things that are pr protected by Title VII, it was, uh, there were other things mixed in there too. And one of the things you need to appreciate is it's not against Title VII to fire somebody or retaliate against them because you don't like them. Okay, that's actually an acceptable, non-discriminatory reason. There are lots of other reasons People can be chronically late. It might not have, in some cases, led to somebody being fired, but um, it could be allowed under the empl employer's rules. Motives get all mixed up in these cases, um, particularly when you get to the point of a retaliation. Uh, there has been a history, a, a long history. What the court did in this case, again, contrary to the prevailing weight of authority and very much contrary to what the administrative agency in this area, EEOC, had written in its guidelines is to say that a plaintiff needs to show, if it's, if it's trying to make a claim, she's trying to make a claim for retaliation, that the discrimination was the but-for cause. If, if it hadn't been for the discriminatory motive, there wouldn't have been any uh, retaliation. So it's a, it, it, it's a, a, both of these cases together can really be seen as taking a very black or white either discrimination occurred or it didn't occur kind of view of what discrimination is as opposed to what the social scientists, most of them anyway, who've studied in this area have determined, which is discrimination today, tends to be much more subtle, more mixed, lots of things going on, um, and lots of harm can be done by people who don't have very many options uh, to, to take care of themselves. Those, the difficulty of all that is really ignored in these two cases. Um, it's going to be a lot harder to prove Title VII cases. Um, and, and already, before these cases, employment discrimination cases are the most difficult category of case for plaintiffs to win. So I don't know what the percentage is. I didn't, didn't, didn't bring the percentages with me, but it's in the third, high 20s and low 30s. It should be about 50-50, you figure, cases that go. Uh, uh, that get survived the pleadings and so on. Are these mostly first years? Yeah. Okay, well, you'll learn all about, it's so exciting to learn all about what it means to survive the pleadings. Um, <laughs> much more exciting than it sounds. But uh, anyway, big step forward in terms of proving discrimination in, the, in this particular statutory area as well as uh, what you might have heard already. Well, one thing we know for certain is that you folks have survived these proceedings. And I want to thank my colleagues for being here. And I want to apologize that we don't have time for Q&A. But I know you need to get to class. We need to teach. And others, I'm sure, need this room. So thank you all. Thank you.